Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on religion and data in the UK. First some introductions. I'm Ali and I'm based at UCL. Also presenting are Tom Clemens based at the Scottish Longitudinal Study at Edinburgh University and Yasin Kuja who's based at Goethe University. This is just um, UKRI. They have various data and method services that they fund and these are the ones. Um, and then also there's a webinar on language and data in the UK which is happening next Wednesday on the 25th of March again from 3 till 4 p.m. And you can go back to UK Data Service to see details of this. So today's webinar, Yasin will be presenting on religion in understanding society. Then I'll present on religion data, which is available in the ONS Longitudinal Study, which covers England and Wales. And then Tom will talk about religion data available in the Scottish Longitudinal Study. If you have any questions, we won't have time to answer them as we go along. So if you can type them into the questions box and then we'll answer them at the end. So over to Yasin, who's going to present about religion data in the Understanding Society. So my name is uh, Yasin Kutya. Welcome to the webinar on investigating religion in the UK. I hope the connection uh, works. Um, my name is Yasin Kutya. I'm a researcher at the Institute of Sociology at the Goethe University Frankfurt am Main. And I will present you some information about how religion is um, studied in the, um, how measured in the, covered in the understanding society data. So my presentation is going to have um, the following structure. So I'm first going to give you a very brief introduction to understanding society data. Um, uh, I can't go really uh, into depth here. That would be beyond the scope of the presentation. But I just want to make you aware of some of the main components of the UK HLS that um, you should be aware of to then understand the second part of my presentation where I'm going to cover some of the specific questions um, that are included in at various um, components, modules, and uh, waves of the uh, UKHLS. Then I'm going to just make two brief examples of um, papers that use uh, the data on um, religion of the UKHLS so that you can get some sort of idea what uh, sort of analysis are possible. And then I'm going to end with some um, final notes on some on, on religion in other UK surveys. So let's start. What is the understanding society data? So you may be aware that um, the UK household longitudinal study is currently the uh, largest household panel study in the UK. <clears throat> it was started in wave one in 2009, um, and currently there's data available up to wave nine. Um, so each wave usually ranges over two years in which uh, the interviews were conducted, um, which is good to keep in mind. Um, it's still up running, so we can expect to have um, several additional waves in the, in the years to come. Now the UKHLS consists of four different sample components. So um, there's a general population sample, the GPS, which uh, has again a Great Britain sample and a Northern Ireland sample um, that's in so far relevant to know as if some variables um, are measured separately for these two uh, samples. Um, and yeah, jointly they consist of about 40,000 households. Um, even more, um, there are even more interviews because sometimes there were several people, of course, um, interviewed within one household. Another com sample component is the BHPS, so that was basically the predecessor of the UKHLS. Um, and um, at the time when the UKHLS started, there were still some remaining households within the um, BHPS, the British Household Panel Study. 
and those were incorporated into the um, UK at Glass at Wave 2. And yeah, I'm not going to go uh, much into that. There are also some questions on religion in the BHPS, but yeah, I, I won't cover those. So if you are interested in these, um, you should uh, have a look at that yourself. Um, then importantly and interestingly, there's uh, an ethnic minority boost sample, which consists of about 4,000 households from the main, uh, the, the largest ethnic minority groups in the UK. So that's Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Caribbean, and Africans. Um, plus additional interviews with some people from other ethnic minorities. And then there's an uh, immigrant and ethnic minority boot sample at wave six, where they basically included an additional 2,900 households of these um, minority groups and immigrants also to somehow adjust for the attrition of the original sample of the minorities and to allow for really more detailed analysis also based on ethnic, group, ethnic minority groups. Um, there are, of course, also ethnic minority members in the general population sample, and those should usually also be included in any sort of analysis, um, because those are also some of um, areas of uh, low ethnic density in contrast to the uh, ethnic minority boost samples, which usually only focus on minorities in um, high ethnic density areas. And yeah, to get the um, to make the data really representative, you need to uh, use the, the weights and include the uh, minorities from both samples to really get some representative analysis. The um, UKHLS has a wide range of topics that are in the regular questionnaires so that, that are asked annually, um, ranging from yeah, health, work, income, education, family life, social life, and so on. Um, so that's uh, really good. Um, but then in addition to that, you also have some rotating modules on specific topics, including religion. Um, and those are not asked every year, but um, yeah, in, a, in, a, in, a regu in regular, in re relatively regular intervals. Um, and then on top of that, you have something that's called the extra five minute questions that were asked to a subset of uh, the samples. Um, and there you have um, additional questions, especially related to issues of ethnicity and immigration, um, which were asked to a subset of the sample and um, yeah, which uh, allow you to go even deeper into some issues, especially related to religion. And I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so if you want to do analysis, if you want more information, here are just some references to user guides, the general user guide and the user guide to the ethnicity and immigration research based on um, understanding society. And also the website is very uh, helpful. So. Yeah, there's much more information there that uh, yeah you can can uh, look up yourself. So let's move on to what sort of questions are included about religion in UKHLS. So there's uh, um, the religion module, um, which is the main module on religion, and this one includes basic some basic information. So you have information about the religious background of respondents, then information about religious participation, so attendance, and then some information about um, what I call now religious belief. Um, and these questions were basically included in the adult questionnaire. Um, they are stored in the file and in DRESP. So in DRESP is the individual level file, which includes most of the information. There are also different other files, which you will note if you, notice if you download the um, data set. And the N here is basically a placeholder. It stands for the various waves. Um, which are labeled as uh, A, B, C, D, and so on um, when you download the data. So um, these questions were asked to all respondents in wave one, wave four, and wave eight. Um, the next um, one is planned for um, wave 12. Um, and in addition, these basic questions were also asked to a new entrants in the extra five minute sample. So let's go, go a bit deeper into that. What are the specific questions that were asked? And first, it's important to note here that um, if you have the data set open, you'll notice that there are different variables um, that measure religious background for the um, Great Britain sample and for the Northern Ireland sample. Um, I'm just going to go briefly through the questions of the um, Great Britain sample with some the, the basic descriptives. Um, so that you get an idea what's covered there. And yeah, if you want to know about the Northern Ireland sample, you can have a look at that yourself. But it's basically the same question, more, more or less the same questions 
um, but um, yeah, in, uh, measured with the with different uh, variables. Um, so the OPRLG item is basically just the question: Do you regard yourself as belonging to any particular religion? And at wave one, as you see, that was asked to um, everyone in the data set, um, and you have about yeah, 26, uh, 27,000 people answering yes, and then about 21,000 answering no. And that's a filter question because based on what respondents answered here, they either um, get the question which religion were you brought up in. So in case people indicated that they do not belong to a religion, then they were asked which religion were you brought up in. And then you see here on the right hand side um, the various religious denominations um, that were used. So also as, as first option, no religion then various different Christian religious denominations, um, also um, uh, Muslim Islam um, as a denomination, and then a few other um, religious groups. Um, and yeah, that's basically um, what was indicated. Um, here is then the question for the respondents who did indicate they belong to religion, and they were asked to which religion um, they um, belong to. And again, that's more or less the same list, except of the no religion answer category. And again, most people answered here, of course, some sort of Christian denomination. But now you see already that the um, case numbers for Muslims um, is higher, and also for the other religious groups, Hindus, Jewish, and uh, Sikh and Buddhists. Um, you see here in the upper, um, in, the, in, the, in the most upper uh, row, there's a minus eight. And these are basically the respondents that are covered in the variables um, for Northern Ireland that I just mentioned earlier. Then the other two questions, religious participation, is pretty straightforward. It's a standard question on attendance. How often, if at all, do you attend religious service or meeting? Um, yeah, with answer categories, uh, once a week or more, less often, but at least once a month, uh, less often, but at least once a year, never or practically never, or only at weddings, funerals. Then there's a question on religious belief, um, which is how much difference would you say religious belief makes uh, to your life? Would you say a great difference, some difference, a little difference, or no difference? So that was basically the religion module. Um, now we have the extra five minute questions where you have uh, some additional, uh, more specific questions, uh, items on, on religion. And let's walk briefly through those. Um, so first of all, the extra five minute questions um, consist of three components. So um, people who belong to the ethnic minority boost sample uh, or to the additional boost that was started at wave uh, six, they were um, asked these additional questions for all of respondents to belong, belong to these uh, different samples. Then uh, it has a general population comparison sample, which is basically a random sample of the general population sample. Um, which is kind of handy to make um, comparisons. And then you have ethnic minorities in low ethnic density areas in the GP sample that are also asked these questions to really make the data um, representative. Uh, within these extra five minute questions, there are again various rotating modules. And the modules that include questions specifically on religion um, are on the one hand the ethnic identity module. Um, which is included in the six-year rotation. So it's asked at wave two, wave eight, and then at wave uh, five additionally for new immigrants and 16 to 19 years old. Then there's uh, praying frequency, which was asked at wave four and wave eight. And then there's um, religious practice, which is also at the six-year rotation and was asked the first time at wave four and then will be included in wave 10, which is the upcoming wave um, next year. And so what are the questions that are included here? So first of all, first of all, you have um, yeah um, questions about the importance of religion to the sense of how people are, um, and I want just to note here these are always two variables, and again the same logic applies here as for the religious background variables. There's one variable which was only asked to people who answered that they belong to a religion, and then um, another variable which was asked to people who said they do not belong to a religion, and then dependingly on what they answered. Um, the reference here was to the current religion or to the religion that people were brought up in. 
So yeah, you have, and how important is your religion uh, or the religion you were brought up in to your sense of who you are? Um, with answer categories from one to four. Um, then as a second, you have, uh, do you feel proud of your religion, the religion you were brought up in with three answer categories, yes, no, neither, yes or no. And then you have, how do you feel when you meet someone who has the same religion as you or the same religion as you were brought up in? And here you had five answer categories from one very happy to five. Very unhappy. Um, then there's a standard question on uh, praying frequency, which was included at wave keep four and eight of the extra five minute sample. So here the question was, apart from when you are at religious services, how often if at all do you pray? Every day, um, more than once a week, once a week, at least once a month, only on specific holidays, less often or never. And then finally, you have the religious practice module, which was so far only asked at wave four, where you really have a whole range, uh, a whole set of, um, of uh, items that cover whether the religious belief of the respondent affects um, various behaviors. So eating, um, drinking, um, clothes, wearing certain types of clothes, um, marriage and dating, um, education, um, yeah, decisions for charitable giving and helping, investments, um, friends, and jobs. And here for each of these items, people could respond with either yes a lot, yes a little, or not at all. <clears throat> so that's the extra five minute question. So these are basically the, the main questions that are included in the um, UK HLS. Um, there are some other uh, some other questions that also somewhat um, address um, religion, um, particularly in relation to um, discrimination when searching for a job or other forms of victimization and harassment where um, there are where, where religion is often asked um, whether where respondents are usually asked whether religion might be one of the reasons for uh, why they were discriminated in the past. So there's much more on these issues, but I didn't include that here now because I didn't think that is something that measures um, really just your religion of respondents um, self. But yeah, if you're interested in that, you can also look at uh, find some more information on the website. So now just some um, research examples. I'm going to go really quickly over that. Um, so there's one paper that I wrote together with um, Lucinda Platt, um, which is called Labor Market Entries and Access of Women from Different Origin Countries in the UK. And here we used um, the item um, religious belief. So how much uh, difference would you say religious belief makes to your life in order to explain ethnic variation in labor market conditions of uh, women, so we basically use this as an independent variable um, to explain uh, labor market transitions. And yeah, the nice thing about this variable, of course, is that it allows you to um, kind of compare religiosity between um, different religious groups, um, which is often problematic if you use um, such measures as attendance, um, where you have really different guidelines um, regarding how often people ought to attend in different religions. Um, another paper which uh, uses um, the UK HLS uh, is by Shannon Cogan, and they basically use uh, the religious affiliation, the religious background measure to create um, a, a neighborhood level um, measurement of uh, religion, so um, yeah, to uh, the share of um, people from the same religion in the neighborhood, or the share of Muslims, and also the share of non uh, religious people and they look at how this affects um, individual life satisfaction. So that's also a very interesting approach that is possible with this data that I wanted to share with you. There are other um, publications that use measures of religion that I didn't include here unfortunately, um, but yeah, you can also look that up at the website um, and search particularly for studies that use religion here. Then finally, to end the presentation, I want just to make some references to other surveys that also include information about religion. There's um, the British Social Attitude Survey, which was asked um, in most years since 1983, um, and usually covers just some basic information on religion, but um, in the years 1991, 1998, and 2008, and 2018, it um, uses the module of the ISSP, so it goes much more into depth about religion. 
And then there's a citizenship survey, which uh, was running from 2001 to 2011, which also includes information on religious affiliation, behavior, and perception of religious prejudice. And yeah, you can search UK data service website to find more surveys that include information about religion. And yeah, any um, data set that I mentioned, you can also find on the website of the UK data service, including understanding society and access to data from there. That was it for my part. Um, thank you for your attention. So yes, I'm Ali, um, and I'm going to talk to you about religion um, in England and Wales um, using data from the Office for National Statistics Longitudinal Study. Um, we're going to start off with a poll. Um, the question is, what was the most frequently reported religion among the England and Wales population in 2011 after Christian. And you need to be aware that Christian includes Church of England, Catholic, Protestant, and all other Christian denominations. Um, and there are four choices, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, or no religion. Okay, so 67% um, uh, said no religion and 32 uh, Muslim. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question might seem quite simple, but it's not. You might have changed your religion, so what religion do you put down, your initial religion or your new religion? Also, you might have a religion, but you might not practice it. So do you then give your religion or do you put another answer? And also, what about minority or unofficial religions? Um, I will, you'll find out how, um, what proportion of people in 2011, um, the highest proportion and what religion they reported after Christian in 2011 later on in the presentation. But the presentation is going to first of all tell you about the Office for National Statistics longitudinal study. Then it will talk about um, religion in the study, um, dealing with what questions were asked, when they've been asked, and how it can be answered. And then briefly, I'll just give you some examples of previous studies that have used religion in the ONSLS. So the longitudinal study is a 1.1% sample of individuals in England and Wales, um, and they're selected if their birthday falls on one of four days in each year. And there is census data from 1971 to 2011. The censuses in the in England, well, in the UK, happen every 10 years. So an individual census forms are linked from 1971 to 2011 for as many years as they were present. And this gives up to 40 years of data on study members. The data also includes information about people in the same household as the LS member at the time of the census that is being completed. So when an, a longitudinal study member is a child, the information on other members of the household might be about their parents and their siblings. But later on, when they're in their 20s and 30s, the information about other people in the household will be on their um, children and their spouse. And the data is also linked to some vital events so that includes births and deaths. Members leave the study through death or through emigrating out of England and Wales. Um, and they enter the study through being born on one of the four birthdays that are used to select the sample or through immigrating into England and Wales and having one of the being born on one of the four days that's used to select the sample. There are two sister studies to the ONS longitudinal study, 
there's a Scottish longitudinal study, which Tom is going to tell you about next. That's a 5% sample, and the data is from 1991 onwards. And then there's the Northern Ireland longitudinal study. That's a 28% sample, and the data is from 1981 onwards. And both of these studies have more data than the ONS-LS does. Um, and there is also information about all three of the studies available on the CALS website. So to use the longitudinal study, there are two access routes. You can either do it in person at a secure setting, um, and there are three of these secure settings in England and Wales. One's in Wales, in Newport, and there are two in England, one in London, and one in Titchfield, in Hampshire. Alternatively, if you can't get to one of the secure settings, then you can submit status scripts or R code, and they can be run remotely for you, and then you will be sent the results. But no data is transferred out of the secure setting until it's been sort of cleared for disclosure checking. In addition to that, all researchers using the ONS-LS need to apply for researcher accreditation or already be an ONS accredited researcher. And if you visit the Celsius website, you can find more information on this and how to apply for it. You will also need to undergo secure data training, and that all has to be done before you will get access to the data and before any analysis will be run for you and any results will be sent to you. So in um, 2001, that was the first census when religion was asked about. And it was asked in question 10, which asks, what is your religion? There were eight tick boxes, starting with none and ending with a write-in box for any other religion. Um, the question was voluntary, so there is also a not stated category in the 2001 religion variable, which is RELP naught. Um, you need to be aware that the Christian tick box includes Church of England, Roman Catholic, Protestant, and all other Christian denominations. However, some people may have ticked any other religion and then written, for example, Catholic in the text box, in which case in that RELP naught variable, they will have been coded in a category called Catholic. And you need to be aware that the people in that category won't necessarily be all Catholics, because the vast majority of them will have ticked the Christian box, first of all. Um, and it might be that people who write Catholic are much more sort of regular goers to church, being more staunch believers. But equally, it could be that they read the question, saw the um, text box at the bottom, and completed that without looking at anything in between. Um, similarly, there are people who write atheist rather than ticking none, although this is less clearly a subset of none than Catholic is a subset of Christian. Um, and since the question was voluntary, none of the values are imputed. So the next slide shows the numbers of people for each religion in 2001 in the nine standard census categories. Um, the missing codes, minus 8 and minus 9, were used for LS members who didn't answer the question, um, and that was about, um, um, that was about 7%. The next, 
The most frequently reported religion, though, was Christian at about 72%. And then the next category was um, none, which was reported by about 14%. In terms of religion, though, Muslim was the next highest proportion of LS members, and that was about 3.24%. So, as you can... So as you can see, um, the sort of next highest religion after Christian in 2001 that was reported was Muslim, but in terms of the next highest category, it was none. Um, the next slide looks at religion in the 2011 census, and it was question 20 in this census and again it asked what is your religion there were eight tick boxes starting with none and ending with a writing box for any other religion the question was voluntary and therefore there's also a not stated category um, and that was and that's in two variables that there are in 2011 RELP 11 and then RELP GP 11 which groups um, the variables into the nine census categories um, and again the next slide shows the proportions and numbers of LS members in 2011 um, and their religion the religion they reported so in this case, minus nine, um, which was no code required, covers students who weren't at their term time, who weren't at their term time address. And then minus eight was just an unacceptable text response. The people who didn't answer the question, because again it was voluntary, um, they were all coded under minus six, which is missing. Um, that was, again, about 7% of the sample, um, so, sorry, 6%, so it's quite similar to sort of the level in 2001. Again, the highest um, or the most frequently reported religion was Christian, um, but that had decreased to 63% from about 72 in 2001. Um, and then the next most high category that was reported was none, and this had increased to 23%, and in um, 2001 it was about 14. Again, though, after Christian, then the actual religion that was reported, the most frequently reported one was Muslim, and it was about the same at 3.2%. Longitudinal data allows us to look at changes in religion of the longitudinal study members that you can't see by using cross-sectional data. So this table shows religion reported by longitudinal study members in 2001 and in 2011 for those members who responded to the question in both um, censuses. The central diagonal, which is highlighted in yellow, shows people who reported the same religion in both 2001 and 2011. And the rows show what happened in 2011 for each religion in 2001. So the orange, they might be cells, but they might be pale pink. Um, they show what happened in 2011 for each religion, sorry, they show what happened for people who were Christian in 2001 um, and what they reported in 2011. Likewise, the blue cells show people who, were, who reported they were Buddhist in 2001 and then the religion they reported in 2011. And the green cells show the same for Hindus. So this table shows the number of LS members um, who responded 
to the religion questions in both 2001 and 2011. And this was about 369,000 LS members. Um, the yellow cells on the diagonal, they show the people who gave the same response in both years, so they gave the same religion. And that covered about 306,000 LS members. However, about 63,000 about 63, changed religion between 2001 and 2011, and that was about 17% of the sample. And the majority of these who changed religion were Christian, and that was about 73% of the people who changed religion between the two years. So the next table shows the same data, but using the percentages. So here, for each religion in 2001, the most common religion in 2011 has been shaded in dark orange. And then the second most common religion has been shaded in a lighter color, so that kind of light orange pink color. Um, if you look at the diagonal ones, then it's Muslims who are the most likely to report the same religion at both time points, and that's about 96% of LS members who responded to the religion question. And the least likely are the other group, and that's about 24% of people. So that's the one diagonal cell which is not shaded in dark orange. Hindus, Sikhs, Jews, and Christians also tend to report the same religion. Of those who stated a religion in 2001 and changed their response to the question in 2011, they usually changed to reporting other or none. In contrast, for those LS members who tick none, i.e. no religion, in 2001 and change religion, they usually change to Christian, and that's about 20% of them. So that is this number here. Okay, this is a list of um, current and previous research using ONS longitudinal study data that also looks at religion. Um, so there's one looking at continuity of non-traditional religious affiliation, and that's by Williams, Dennett, and Shelton. Um, then Sylvie Dubert has looked at the fertility of ethnic and religious groups in the UK, and Henderson and Hatt, oh, Rob Henderson and Hattersley have looked at regional patterns of teenage births in relation to social factors in education, and that um, in the social factors include religion. Um, there's also a study on mortality and religion, and you can find out more um, about these studies from the Celsius website. So to access the data for the ONS LS, um, you can do that through the support unit, and that's Celsius. I'm one of the USOs, the user support officers there. Um, and you can also find out more about accessing the data from the Celsius website. And Tom, who is going to present next, he will tell you about um, how you get access to the data to the Scottish Longitudinal Study. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening, and I just need to acknowledge that the data that's being presented um, uses the Office for National Statistics Longitudinal Studies, and that although it contains ONS statistical data, it does not um, imply the endorsement of the ONS in relation to the interpretation or analysis. So now, 
it's over to Tom. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ali, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Tom Clemens, uh, and uh, I'm part of the Scottish Longitudinal Study uh, here at the University uh, of Edinburgh. So I'm going to be uh, fairly brief, I think, because a lot of what uh, Ali has covered um, also applies uh, to the SMS. Um, but there's a couple of key differences, I think, between the Office of National Statistics uh, Longitudinal Study and what we have uh, here in Scotland. Um, it is uh, the, the SMS, the Scottish Longitudinal Study, is based um, on the, the census in the same way as the ONS Longitudinal Study. Uh, we have a slightly larger proportional capture of the Scottish population, so we capture 5.5% of the Scottish population uh, based on uh, 20 uh, semi-random birth dates. Uh, this gives us uh, around 270,000 uh, SLS members um, and around 505,000 uh, household members associated with those SLS members. Uh, and similar to the ONS, uh, the ONS LS, sorry, uh, this uh, data allows us to cover or examine a wide range of questions, ranging from kind of demographic and economic questions to health, housing, migration, and fertility, uh, and so on. Um, importantly, this you know the large population capture that we have uh, allows for quite de detailed geographical information, uh, quite detailed geographical analyses. Uh, and users are able to provide their own lookup tables um, for their own specific research projects that can be linked to uh, the SLS. But apart from a few key differences, then the SLS functions in very, in very much the same way as the ONS longitudinal study. Um, so one area that the SLS is slightly different um, is that we have um, some extra data sets over the ONS LS that we're uh, quite fortunate to have. Um, the main data that we have uh, is the 1991, 2001, and 2011 census. Um, and linked to that, we therefore we also have uh, information around births, deaths, and marriages. Uh, we also have migration information, which uh, is used in one of the studies that I'll go on to show as an example later on in, in this presentation. Uh, but we also have uh, access to school education information from 2007, so that includes the uh, pupil census and um, attainment information as well. Uh, we've also linked in environmental information um, uh, as well as a, whole, a set of other kind of geographical uh, variables. Quite crucially as well in Scotland, we're very lucky to be able to link the uh, SLS to um, wider NHS Scotland data. So we're able to link to things like hospital admissions data and uh, other uh, health data sets, quite a wide range of health data sets, which uh, obviously can be studied alongside the, the data that we already have in, in the census records, including religion, for example. So uh, I just want to kind of highlight with this slide the fact that the, all three of these studies are quite similar. I know Ali's touched on this already. Um, and it's just to note that there is the possibility of doing comparative studies. Uh, and that's quite a powerful resource, um, uh, quite a powerful resource, particularly in relation to studies interest in religion. And one of the uh, other projects that I'll go on to discuss later on as a good example uh, of this. OK, so moving specifically to the question of religion uh, in the SLS, uh, what we have are um, religion collected in two censuses. So uh, the religion question was asked in 2001 and 2011, but not in the census in 1991. Uh, similar to the ONSLS, the questions on religion were not compulsory, so there is the possibility of selectivity uh, in the response to these variables, as noted by Ali earlier. Okay, so um, I won't spend too much time on these slides simply because they're very similar to uh, what Ali has just presented, but here are the questions as they were asked in the actual census. Uh, crucially in Scotland, there are two key differences uh, in the religion information that we have in Scotland compared to uh, England and Wales. The first being uh, that we ask uh, two questions. So we don't just ask uh, what, religious, what religion do you currently practice, um, but we also ask what religion or religious denomination uh, you were brought up as, uh, which is quite an important uh, additional piece of information that we have in, in Scotland. Um, and we'll go on to discuss how, what, how that's been used in some other studies in a second. Uh, so both questions have a relatively high valid response rate um, in the 90%, um, so that's, that's great. Uh, but the second key difference that we have in Scotland is that we uh, have separate categories uh, in the Christianity group, 
So we separated uh, Church of Scotland uh, and Roman Catholic. Uh, obviously, Scotland has a uh, history of sectarianism, and it's an issue that's uh, quite a, one of importance in Scotland, which is why uh, the census up in, uh, here in Scotland has differentiated between those uh, two between those categories. So that's been a focus. So a lot of research that's used this information in the SNS already uh, has been to study the issue of sectarianism uh, in Scotland. Okay, so here is uh, the numbers uh, for the religion variable in 2001. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of the numbers that we have available, you can see um, that we've, we've got these separate categories for Roman Catholic uh, and Church of Scotland. Uh, and those are the two dominant uh, religious groups in Scotland, as you can, uh, as you, perhaps not surprising. Uh, but you can see as well that despite uh, the relatively low proportions overall in the population for some of the for, for other religious groups, we've still got relatively high numbers uh, for, for subgroup analysis, if that's what you're interested in. So that's the, uh, what religions you belong to uh, in 2001. Now, I mentioned uh, before that obviously we have this additional variable which um, allows us to examine how uh, how you were raised uh, and what religion you were raised, which obviously allows us to see people who have changed their religion um, from childhood into adulthood. Uh, now, this table looks a bit sparse, and that's simply because a number of the cells are too small. Uh, so for um, reasons of disclosure, control, and confidentiality, we've had to restrict the output. So those, those blank cells will have numbers in them. They're just very, very small, and, and we weren't able to release those. But what we can see really from this, this slide is just an indication of the numbers of people who have uh, who uh, reported a different religion in adulthood than, than that uh, with which they were raised uh, during childhood. So most people stick to the same religion um, from childhood into adulthood. Some uh, switch between uh, some of the Catholics over here, Church of Scotland and Roman Catholic, but the vast majority are consistent with their religion. So moving on to the religious questions in the 2011 census, so both of those uh, questions uh, relate to the 2001 census. Moving to 2011, uh, the question on the religion with which you were brought up uh, is no longer asked, so that's an important thing to remember. If you're looking to use the SLS, we don't have information on the religious denomination you were brought up in, in 2011, uh, but we do have the standard question about your current uh, religious denomination. And here are just some numbers um, for the different groups in the 2011 uh, census for, for reference as well. Okay, so I wanted to just illustrate um, three, uh, three research examples showing how the SLS religion information has been used in, in a number of studies. Uh, as I said before, most of these studies are focused on uh, the issue of sectarianism uh, in Scotland. Uh, and I think this particular example illustrates the real value of the information we have in Scotland, uh, particularly around the, uh, the fact that we have household information. So we're able to see uh, intersectarian partnerships and get an understanding of changes in intersectarian partnerships over time. Uh, so this study was interested in examining how uh, partnerships between, particularly between Catholic and Protestant individuals has changed or has changed with age. Uh, so you can see that most, uh, if you look at table three here, most uh, religious partnerships are between the same uh, religious individuals, so Protestant, Protestant, and Catholic, Catholic, and, and the vast majority of these partnerships, or vast majority of partnerships in Scotland are uh, to people of the same, either the same religion or practicing no religion at all. What we can see if we look at figure four is that a lot of this is changing over time, uh, so particularly among younger uh, individuals. Uh, we can see that there are a great many that there are less uh, a proportion less uh, couples that are um, homog homogamous, uh, and there are more relationships between different people of different religious um, denominations. So, and, and as the authors note in this study, um, this might tell us something about the changes in in the degree of sectarianism uh, and and increasing integration uh, of different religious groups in Scotland, which is quite a an important and powerful message and uh, something that's uh, made possible by the data we have here in Scotland. Uh, I think another real advantage um, that we have with the longitudinal studies in general um, is the ability to conduct comparisons across the different developed administrations in the UK. So this was a study examining the potential for differences in mortality risk between different religious groups but comparing those differences between uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and the really interesting thing about this study is that Northern Ireland, in comparison to Scotland, has enacted an, a number of uh, important pieces of legislation 
designed to decrease or um, remove or deal with discrimination, particularly sectarian discrimination, uh, which hasn't obviously occurred in Scotland. So we have quite a nice natural experiment comparing how uh, how this this type of legislation might have impacted on mortality differences between different groups. Uh, and what we can see here is that actually in Northern Ireland, the mortality differences, you can see it in these red boxes, uh, but the mortality differences between Protestants and Catholics in, in Ireland is, is much less uh, noticeable than, than the same comparisons in Scotland. And of course, this, this kind of analysis really takes advantage of the similarity between the data sets, um, the longitudinal studies data sets uh, in the UK. Okay, the final example then is, is, a, is, a, is a, I guess, a more simple example, but just interested in how religion influences migration. Um, so taking advantage of the fact that we can compare people's locations between different censuses, uh, and we can use this to look at how religion plays a part in uh, people's migration patterns with a number of uh, interesting conclusions uh, from that analysis. So that's uh, just a real kind of quick, brief intro to what the SLS, uh, what the possibilities are with SLS uh, data, particularly uh, but religious variables in the SLS. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I have. Well, I have to say I'll pass back to someone, I'm not sure who, for uh, questions, I think. Thank you for listening.